So this is a story about a frog, a frog who lived long ago and far away. Actually, that's a lie. This is not a story about a frog. But that's fairy, how fairy tales and more broadly fantasies begin, right? Not here and not now, but in this other place and this other time. Let me tell you, some unbelievable stuff happened. Fantasy, really all fictions require this type of teleportation in time and space. They're always about being not here and not now. Their very success as fictions, in fact, relies on dislocating you in time and space, projecting you elsewhere. Now, I teach at Champlain College in an MFA program for emergent media. What is emergent media, you may ask? Thank you, that's an excellent question. <laughs> my, my Pecha Kucha-sized answer is that we study the symbiotic and emergent relationship between technology and culture. So as a technologist, you might think, well, of course he drank the Kool-Aid, right? He must look at technology with unbridled optimism. Well, not exactly. I study what I study because I'm skeptical, critical. I want to keep an eye on all this. I want to make sure that we do it right, and I care that we do it right. So this is a story about a frog who got into some hot water. No, it's not a story about a frog. But while we're on the subject, did you know that if you put a frog in boiling water, he'll jump right out? And if you put a frog in tepid water and raise the temperature very, very slowly, he'll sit there and he'll cook. But I digress. The first technologically virtual experience was arguably the telephone. In this virtual experience, the virtual part is that you're in one place and I'm in another. So when exactly and where exactly is our conversation taking place? It's not here because you're not here. It's not there because I'm not there. It's kind of both places at once, but that's not really possible in reality. So we say, oh, well, it's a, it's a virtual reality. For us to make that work, however, we have to construct a shared fiction. It requires our mutual and voluntary dislocation in time and space. Well, from there it got worse. The story of modern technology, in fact, is about finding ever-efficient means of messing with our sense of time and space. In our technocentric culture, we are never where and when we are. Information, entertainment, you name it, and it's available on demand, anytime and anywhere, which put another way could be expressed as, where the hell is it? Where the hell are we in relation to it? This contemporary condition can be disconcerting. Our incessant need to document our existence. Are we not sure of it ourselves? We curate our identity online as a collection of evidence that we are living our lives. I did go apple picking. Apple picking. I have the photos to prove it. <laughs> I took this at the Louvre in front of the Mona Lisa. <laughs> these are all people standing in front of the Mona Lisa. None of these people feel comfortable at all that this is actually happening. They need to collect evidence. Actually, they're experiencing the aura of the original, but that's a different talk entirely. And what about this person? Whenever this happened at this moment, where was this person psychologically? In a mirror, on the phone screen, already imagining the glory of posting it on Facebook? The fragmentation of time and space in this one image alone is dizzying. Okay, so I've made my point, right? Technology allows us to collapse time and space, to collapse it and li literally put it into our pocket. We are in control of when and where we are, are we not? It's a wondrous age, a fantastical age. But while one of these collapsings of time and space is amazing, hauntingly beautiful and hopeful, this other collapsing of time and space, eh, not so much. A little problem there, and this is one you really should show up for probably. And I wonder, when so many people are depressed, anxiety-ridden, lacking real connection with each other and this earth, is humanity not a little sicker for it? Are we not lost in time and space most of the time?
Honestly, though, I'm most worried about the fate of prepositions. Did you ever notice that prepositions always function to locate us in time and space? If we don't need them anymore, what is going to happen to the suite before and after? Will they be left down and out? So I'll come clean. I have drunk the Kool-Aid. I'm mostly technologically optimistic. I'm a geek, and I'm a hopeful geek because I believe the narrative of our technological future is not human beings becoming more machine-like, but that our machines can and will be made more human-like. Not in the scary robot uh, uncanny valley kind of way, but <laughs> what I mean is that we are the designers, and as technology seeps into every aspect of our lives, we need to design it to work in the context of a meaningful life, not just a more productive or efficient life, but grounded in the physical state of being. Our very happiness depends on it. So I know what you're saying. Haven't we always experienced dislocations like this? Well, yes, but these were once the rare exception. Novelties. The ability to dislocate is now required of us as a matter of routine to work, to always be on, to even function in this society. And if the response is, well, it's always been like that, then I say, well, yeah, of course, the water in the pot's always been warm, but does it feel like it's getting hotter? But then again, this is not a story about a frog. <laughs> Thank you.